So this is going to be a really great part of our day. And uh, David Burkus, I was turned on to David a couple of years ago from a supplier that actually saw you at an IFMA convention, David, who called me up and said, this guy's fantastic, you got to have him. And at that, that time, I, I'm a big reader of business books. I grabbed his under new management book off of Amazon, which all of you now have. And I've read a lot of business books, and I absolutely loved it. I'm like, this is so innovative and, and so in, such an interesting approach to looking at business that I'm like, oh my gosh, we have to sign him up. So we're lucky enough to have him he here today. And just a couple of uh, notes about him. He was named as the world's top business, or one of the world's top business thought leaders by Thinkers 50. And a lot of it's about building key connections and networks. And he's also an associate professor of leadership and innovation at Oral Roberts University. And I have to tell you some really weird karma. So Dallas Chapman, who's out of Tulsa yesterday, came to me and said, I have to meet David Burkus because I do all the work at Oral Roberts. And I'm like, I'm sure that could happen. And I'm literally telling David, hey, this gentleman, D uh, Dallas Chapman, and here comes Dallas walking by out of 350 people. Is that weird or what? That just means this meeting continues to have great karma. So, and he was recently named, David was recently named one of the nation's top 40 under 40 professors who inspire. So, I know you're going to enjoy him, and with that, I'm going to invite David Burkus. Thank you. Thank you. So, I have good news for you. I know how to solve the moisture problem. <laughs> Actually, I don't have a clue. Um, but if you do know, let me know, because we have a walkout basement in our house, and I'm actually really worried about exactly that. So um, what I can do, I, I have been sitting in on sessions trying to sort of hiding and, and paying attention to different things. Is What I can do is I want to speak to the, the labor issue. A lot of people were talking about the labor shortage, and one of the things I think gets overlooked when you're just trying to find talent is sometimes I think a lot of times we settle, and we just find talent and then it doesn't really work out, et cetera. So we're going to talk about a number of different ideas today that have to do with the whole life cycle of the people that work for us, whether full-time employees, contractors, or what have you, and moving through that life cycle about creating an experience that both brings out the best in them, but then also makes more money for us, because when they are doing their best, everybody's performing better. To, to do that, though, I want to tee up a, a quick thought, and it'll be the guiding thought for all of our time today, and, and that thought is this that great leaders don't innovate the product, they innovate the factory. And when I say product and I say factory, I'm not just thinking about products. I'm not just thinking about creating uh, new products to offer, new services, et cetera. I'm talking about uh, service-based businesses too. I'm talking about innovations in the way that we deal with customers, innovations that we wait, the way that we deal with employees. Most of the time when you look at some groundbreaking, disruptive innovation, what you find is that the company had made some changes before that preceded that, that allowed employees or even senior leaders to come up with that idea. And so great leaders don't innovate the product, they innovate the factory. Today we'll be talking about the metaphorical factory. I use it as a metaphor for anywhere work gets done. So if you're involved in the actual factory production of products, great. If you're just involved in services, great, because it's all going to be relevant to you. And to give you an idea, this, this theory, this idea that great leaders don't innovate the product, they innovate the factory, this has been true for over 100 years. The example that I, I like to start with a lot of times is it was true over 100 years ago when Bethlehem Ironworks reached out to who is probably, arguably, history's first management consultant. They reached out to this man and they said, we're having a problem competing in uh, the steel industry. So it's Bethlehem Iron Works. Already they have a branding problem, right? Their brand strategy is pretty off. They're Bethlehem Iron Works and they predominantly make steel. But we're, we're losing out to bigger competitors, US Steel, et cetera, as more and more uh, mergers and acquisitions are happening, as certain companies are exploding, we, a smaller producer, are having a real hard time keeping up. Does that sound familiar, anybody? No, not familiar at all, right? And they reached out to this very, the very first management consultant, and he came with what would become legendary. He came with not a bunch of ideas. He came with a stopwatch and a notebook. And he asked, who are, your, who are your top performers? And at the time, a lot of factory work wasn't what we think of now with the assembly line and what have you. A lot of times, it was individual craftsmen who just happened to work in the same shop. So he said, who are your outstanding performers? And he started watching every step of the production process. And he started timing those exceptional performers. And what he did was he created a system whereby we knew what is the one best way to produce each action. 
Now, I'm, I'm a little nerdy, I'm a management professor, so I'll give you an idea of how detailed this man went. He studied the people that fueled the furnace and found that the optimal amount of coal that a man, a male employee, should be shoveling into the fire is 16 and a half pounds. Any more than that and you burn out and get fatigued, any less than that and you're not being optimal. 16 and a half pounds. File that under information you're never gonna need to know. But it gives you a hint of the level of specificity. But then he went even further. He looked around and he could not find a shovel that would hold exactly 16 and a half pounds of coal, so he started redesigning the shovel. So when I say innovate the factory, I mean innovate the factory. And between that and their branding issue, Bethlehem Steel became one of the largest providers for a time. I always feel weird giving this example because I know I grew up in, in outside of Philadelphia and spent some time in Central PA and I always feel bad mentioning Bethlehem Steel and anything to do with Allentown. Because while it was true 100 years ago, they haven't exactly caught up more recently. But it, it, it worked in that capacity, it innovated the factory and really this man who went by the name of Frederick Winslow Taylor, I like to think of him as, as Freddie because it's easier, but this man who went by the name Frederick Winslow Taylor kick-started the Industrial Revolution. A lot of the major innovations that happened in factory and production work were started from his ideas. His book, Principles of Scientific Management, came out 100 years ago. This year, it is still in print. I can tell you as an author, I hope anything that I write can even be found 100 years from now, let alone still in print. You can go on Amazon.com today and buy multiple different copies of the book because it's public domain. It's still selling tons of copies. His, grand, his grandson, went into the same field and there's a story that when he started consulting to Japan, a place that really utilized a lot of Taylor's ideas to kickstart their factory work in the uh, 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s, the executives of major corporations in Japan were bowing lower to his grandson than they were to him because of this impact that he had. Now, before we get too much into a Frederick Taylor love fest, I have a problem with some of those insights. And I think you will too. So for an example, Here's an excerpt from Principles of Scientific Management that speaks to his underlying management philosophy. Taylor wrote that the duty of enforcing the adoption of standards and enforcing cooperation rests with management alone. What does this mean? Well, what Taylor firmly believed was that every company, especially industrial factories, especially places where you couldn't just rely on a couple family members working in a trade, every major organization needed two tiers of employees. They needed management and they needed labor. And management's job was to figure out exactly what to do, down to the most minute detail, 16 and a half pounds of coal, to figure out exactly what to do. And labor's job was to shut up and do it. Labor's job wasn't to think, labor's job wasn't to solve problems, labor's job was just to listen to what some guy with a stopwatch and a notebook said is the optimal thing to do. And while it worked for that time, there's a problem with it, which is most of us, are either not working in factories the way that Frederick Taylor was working with in the 1920s, or if we are working in industrial work, it's such a complicated, I mean, technology drives most of the innovation now problem that you can't say that labor's job isn't to solve problems anymore. The days of just sort of show up and do the same thing over and over again, those days have passed and most of us are managing organizations or leading organizations that are far more complex to have this split between management and labor. As I like to say it, most of us have moved from a physical factory to an idea factory. Even if we're involved in production in any capacity, most of us are in a situation where solving problems is everyone's job. Coming up with ideas is everyone's job. And if it's not, it will need to be. The problem I have isn't that Frederick Taylor's ideas weren't great for the time. He proved that principle, that great leaders don't innovate the product, they innovate the factory. At the same time, the problem I have with it is that we drug that rule book that he wrote with us from the physical factory to the idea factory. I mean, it's the reason television shows like The Office and cartoons like Dilbert and movies like Office Space, which by the way, did you know you can still buy a red swing line stapler, stapler on the internet? Do you know what I'm talking about? I have one on my shelf. I bought one the other day and I put it on my bookshelf because I want to look at it more than I want to use it. To remind myself of what happens when people treat the sort of Frederick Taylor idea that there is management and there's labor, and labor's job isn't to question, labor's job isn't to speak up, labor's job is just to do what we have to do, to remind myself that that principle is outdated. But the core idea that we've moved from a physical factory to an idea factory and that great leaders don't innovate the product, they innovate the factory, to prove that those ideas are still valid. So I've spent the last 
uh, five or six years looking at what some of the most innovative companies in a variety of different fields are doing when it comes to that idea factory. How are they managing the way that they treat people in order to produce innovations in everything from customer service to an industrial products? And today what I want to share is a couple different ideas that represent the future of work and also the future of management. I think in particular, a lot of times, and I'll give you this warning, a lot of the examples that we'll talk about will start at large companies and move down to smaller businesses. And a lot of times there's a temptation to go, oh, well, that's a company with 10,000 people. I'm, I don't manage that. But all of us are competing for the same, largely the same talent pool a lot of times. And so all of us have to think about how are we treating employees in that capacity. The other thing is that just because that company is doing it doesn't mean we can't apply a version of it. So for that reason, we're going to talk about not just what are the trends going on, but what is the underlying social science that backs up those trends? My background is as an organizational psychologist, and so most of the time when I heard about a lot of these different ideas, I immediately went to, oh, there's a wealth of research that supports that idea. So I'm gonna give you that as well, and then lastly, I'll give you a few ideas for takeaways for our own individual businesses. And as I said before, we're gonna talk about the whole sort of life cycle of talent, so we should start at where we, where we find talent. And one of the most interesting things I've seen in terms of developing it is that there's a dramatic shift in the way that companies that are getting great talent are hiring said talent. Right? So most of us, I mean, most of us either came up with our own system for finding new employees and hiring them, or we borrowed a system from some other company that we used to be familiar with. And so most of us, it looks like this, right? It usually starts with a phone call. If you're a large organization and you have the ability to post resumes on certain job boards and get electronic uh, resumes, it might start with that. But in most cases, it starts with a phone call. Large, large organizations a lot of times refer to this as a phone screen. Have you ever used that term? Right, so the whole point is I've got a stack of resumes and I'm just trying to screen through who's lying and who's not actually excited and who might be a felon even though they said they're not, right? Okay, some people that sounds very, very familiar. <laughs> some people have done through that. So it starts with that. The people that make that cut then get invited into a one-person sort of face-to-face -face interview. And if, you know, we talk about a variety of different things and if we have a good feeling about it, I mean, a lot of times these interviews feel more like a first date than like a structured process for sifting through talent. Am I right? Have you ever felt that? I mean, both of you are sort of your highly polished selves. Both of you are trying to win that other person over, even though you're trying to figure out if they're a fit for you. It's not a bad metaphor. And then if that works, of course, we move to the next stage, which is what I call the meet the parents stage. We either bring in another partner, another person who's in a senior role in the organization, and we ask for their sort of backup in that final round interview. And then then if, it, if, if everything clicks, if everything feels great, we've spent a sum total of maybe two hours and 15 minutes with this person, we'll make a decision to hire them for 20, 40, 60 hours a week for the next couple of years of our life. We'll, we'll spend more time with them than we will our actual family based off two hours or so. And then what happens a lot of times, some of those people who we made, we felt good about, we made that decision, they don't work out. They don't turn out to be great workers, they're just great talkers. Has this happened to any, this has only ever happened to me, apparently? No? Okay, all right, I'm seeing some. So what, I'll tell you a, just a fun aside. I once spoke to a group of um, RIAs, Registered Investment Advisors, financial analysts, the people that made stock recommendations to clients, and I asked this question and everyone nodded. And I looked at them and I thought, really? Because if, if ever there were a group of people who should be looking at a resume and remembering that past performance is not indicative of future results, it would be the people that handle mutual funds. But no, I mean, this happens to a lot of us, and it, it really speaks to this idea that the way that we're choosing talent is, is kind of broken. So there's a number of organizations that are doing things a little bit differently. One of my favorites, for the first two decades of their existence plus, Whole Foods Market of all places, was committed, this is before the Amazon acquisition, um, and if you've noticed, if you're a Whole Foods regular customer, you've noticed there's a lot of things that changed after the Amazon acquisition. But they grew to such an amazing uh, influence in the US and beyond because for the first two decades plus, Whole Foods was committed to running their organization on teams. In fact, when you, got, uh, when you started with them, you found out they actually asked you to read and sign a declaration of interdependence. We are all interdependent upon each other. We run on teams. We, nobody can do this alone. 
In fact, even the CEO position is actually a co-CEO position of three people that run the organization as a team. And so it made sense that when it came to choosing talent, they also wanted to run that on teams. So if you look at an organization like Whole Foods for the first 20 plus years, their hiring process looked like this. Still started with that phone call, still started with are you lying, are you actually excited to work here, et cetera. But if you made that cut, then you met with uh, the store manager or a regional supervisor if you were applying for an office job or, or a, a senior leader if you were applying for a home office job. You met with that person and they chose whether or not to hire you and what team to place you on, but then, the whole thing turns over to the team. You get placed on a team and you work for that team for 30 to 60 days, depending on the position, and then the team votes on whether or not you get to stay. It takes a two-thirds majority of vote, by the way, in order to get to stay, and some of you are looking at me like, that sounds a lot like some game show. Well, it's exactly like Survivor. It's essentially the whole plot of Survivor. Are you gonna make the cut or are we voting you off the island? But for them, it actually works. In fact, John Mackey, the co one of the co-CEOs of Whole Foods, says that a team doesn't fully gel until it doesn't vote somebody on the team, which is a weird sentence if you think about it for two or three seconds. But if you think about it for longer, it makes a lot of sense. So what John Mackey says is that a, a team that's charged with running, let's say, a department in, uh, in the supermarket or a, a regional department that's changed with making sure that everybody has what they need to do, a team that is highly interdependent doesn't fully gel until it doesn't vote somebody on the team, meaning that team has decided we have standards, we have levels of accountability, we expect certain levels of performance. And then a new person comes on the team, and if that new person, if our standards are here, and that new person comes on the team, and they're actually just performing it here, well then we don't actually have a standard up here. I mean, think about your own organization. If you have certain expectations, if you have certain standards of performance, if you have a way that people are supposed to act, even if it's little things like not being a jerk, if you have little things about your organization that are, that are key, that say our performance standard is up here, and somebody comes in and they're down here, and you allow that person to continue working, you allow that person to be keeping on the team, your standard is actually here. You can say whatever you want about it being up here, but your standard is here. So you think about the teams inside of Whole Foods, a team doesn't fully gel because it doesn't fully know what its expectations for performance, for accountability, for interdependence are until it runs into the example of someone who doesn't meet up to that and then they have to make the difficult choice of whether or not that person gets to stay. Now it's not a total loss, so if you get voted off the team, the store manager could actually decide or the regional manager could actually decide, do I put you on a different team and see if it's a personality issue or do I, let's think of a good, euphemism for this. Do I invite you to be successful somewhere else? Let's go with that. Do I invite you to be successful at some other customer? Or do I upgrade you to a customer status? Right? You're not an employee. You've been promoted. You're now just a customer. <laughs> so a team doesn't fully gel until it doesn't vote somebody on the team. Now what I find fascinating about this is it's actually in line with what we know about teams and even about individual performance and what we've known for the last 10 plus years. To give you an idea of that research though, we gotta move from the, the, uh, the market floor and we've gotta move actually to the trading floor and I'm gonna tell you about a study by a, name, a man by the name of Boris Groisberg. Now I'm a professor, but I do not have a professor name. Boris Groisberg, that's a professor name, right? You can almost picture like the tweed coat with the elbow patches when I just say his name, right? So by the way, if you ever wanna sound Smart, pick a professor name like that and then say, according to such and such's research, we should do X. It's a great way to sound smart. You just have to pick the name wisely. So anyway, according to Boris Groisberg's research, what we should do, nobody caught that? <laughs> Groisberg studied investment, uh, institutional investment analysts. So these are the people, to, to go back to Wall Street for a second, these are the people that study an industry. These, these are the people that might end up in orange jumpsuits if they tell you too much some of the time, right? Because they know what's going on inside an industry, they've studied it for so long, but they actually do make projections about where a market is gonna go growth-wise. Most of them work either for an investment bank or for an advisory firm, and most of them are rated by the people who make the large investment decisions. In terms of institutional investors, the people that manage hedge funds, mutual funds, pension funds, et cetera, those institutional investors need this information. And so every year, it's a, a trade magazine, ironically called Institutional Investor, runs a ranking of who are the best analysts inside of each firm. Who are the top people in every single industry? And they take a, a vote throughout the whole industry 
some 11,000, uh, excuse me, 1,100 analysts. They take a vote and then they rank those people, first, second, third, and then an honorable mention, so fourth. And you can imagine what happens when somebody has proven themselves to be a star piece of talent and the whole industry knows that this person is a star performer. You can imagine what happens. The phone rings, uh, in a good way this time. The phone rings, right? Headhunters are calling. They're saying, do you want to come over here? We'll pay you a million dollars to come over to our investment bank and do the same thing you're doing now. And some of those people, they take the offer and, and others don't. And so what Groisberg wondered is what happens after that person, that star performer, actually moves over to a different organization? What happens to them? So to do that, compile the database of 11, almost 1,100 analysts, studied their movements over nine years, selected 24 investment banks that represented these 1,100, and did in-person interviews with the people who were hired, the people who made the decision to hire, the people who left uh, or who remained in the company after those people may have left. All told, did 167 hours of interviews for what happens, especially on performance, when a star employee, somebody who looks like they're going to be an amazing talent, when they move over to a different firm. And here's what he found. When those people switch, the first thing that happens is the performance of the star declines. That person who we thought was great doesn't work out. This is why I know that everybody's had one of those incidents, right? Because it happens often. We find somebody who looks like they're going to be a star performer, we move them over and that performance declines. The thing I think is most interesting is that the performance of the new group, the new team that that star performer has been put on also declines. Even if they weren't star level performance before, adding a superstar actually causes the team's performance to decline and the overall valuation of the whole company decreases. This one actually makes perfect sense. If you're offering somebody a million dollars because they got ranked by a magazine and then they don't work out, yeah, your company's valuation is gonna suffer, right? There was one situation though where the, the performance of those star performers um, transitioned beautifully from one firm to another. And this has the key for us no matter what business we're in. That situation is known as a lift out in the industry. It's when you say, you are an amazing analyst, we want to, to bring your knowledge into the organization, so we're gonna hire your whole team, all of the researchers that work underneath you, all of the teammates, we're gonna hire your whole unit, and we're gonna move them all the way over, almost like an organ transplant, right? We're gonna pick the, pick the whole thing up and move it over here. And when that happens, the performance of the individual stars did not decline, the performance of the team did not uh, decline, and the company's valuation was safe. Which begs a really interesting question, sort of why? So as Groisberg dug into the research, what he found was that in that case, 60% of the performance of those stars was actually a result of the people that they worked with. The people that were with them every single day working alongside them. And the network of people that were supplying them the information that they need. Now the big lesson here, no matter what industry that anyone is in, and no matter what type of talent pool you're looking at, is that often, individual performance is increased when team talent is increased. Which means we have to pay attention not just to the whole team, but when we add new people, we have to pay attention to how are they gonna fit in with the existing team. This is the secret to why it works for Whole Foods. Right? They're not lifting out whole groups of people. It's not saying like, oh, well, Kroger, you've got a great meat department. Let's pick you up and move you over. I mean, that's actually not a bad idea, but that's not what they're doing. Instead, what they're saying is your fit on this team is going to be instrumental in your performance. And so we're inviting that team of people in to help us make the decision about whether or not we hire you. And I think a lot of us can think about it that way, right? Especially a lot of times with small business owners too, the smaller your business, the more we sort of make hiring our job only. And if they click with us, that's what matters. And a lot of times we can ignore, well, wait a minute, the person that they're going to be working alongside, the person they're in the truck with every single day, or the, the, the vendors, the suppliers, everybody that they're going to be interacting with on a daily basis, their ability to click with those people matters way more than me. And we see this in a variety of different organizations from other fields as well. And in, the, in the tech world, there's a company known as Automatic. They make a product you probably have never heard of Automatic, but they make a product you've probably heard of, which is a product called WordPress. If you've got a website advertising your business, you've got like a 25% uh, chance that it runs on a WordPress site. How do I know that? Well, because WordPress powers 25% of all websites across the world. And they work in, in geographically dispersed teams. Everybody works from wherever they want. And they run a hiring process that sounds really similar to that first hiring process we were talking about. However, what the, the CEO, Matt Mullenweg, would say is if they seem like a good match at the end of that hiring process, they get a chance to try out for their position. They're not hired, they get invited to do an audition or a trial. Now what's key is it's not just like, it's not like a, a, 
a workflow simulation. It's not like just come for a day. They work for eight weeks on real customer projects. If they require a, an email address to interact with customers in a customer service capacity, we get them that. If they require security logins, we get them that. We get them whatever they need. For all intents and purposes, they are a full-time employee, even though we're just gonna pay them a 1099 at the end. If there's a health insurance reason or something like that, we might bring them in, but it is very clear that they only work here for eight weeks. And at the end of that eight weeks, everyone that they've interacted with gets invited to a survey. Every person on the company that gets invited, everybody that uh, potentially, if you have a close enough relationship, even if you don't work for the company, you get invited to put a survey in on how they did. All of that survey feedback gets collected, and then the CEO, Matt Mullenweg, the CEO of the company, still does an inter final round interview with that person after the trial. Here's what I think is really interesting. He does it via text. He texts back and forth with them, or puts them in a chat room. Does it entirely by text, like you would, like you would chat with customer service, right? And the reason I asked him this, because I thought that was really, you don't want to meet these people? You don't even want to do like a face-to-face -face Skype call with these people? He said, no, because I don't care if I click with them. What matters is what the people they just spent eight weeks working with, that's what matters. And those people ultimately have the responsibility for whether or not this is a good employee. I want to know certain things about what they're going to be like, and I want to talk to them about the business, but the decision's already been made with those people. So if I had a face-to-face -face interview with them, I would be biased in whether or not I clicked with them, and I don't care. I care about what my team clicks with them. And I think that's an amazing way to think about it. The people that are going to be involved working alongside that person should be brought in. The same thing we see in a much larger company. I don't know, have you ever heard of this company? They make a couple things that are pretty good. They, they used to run a multiple, uh, into the dozen or even half, or just dozen or two dozen interview process, and they've dramatically cut it down to about four interviews. And here's how most of them work now. So you've got that initial resume screen, remote interview with a recruiter. So are you crazy? Are you actually excited? Are you a felon? Then you have interviews with uh, a hiring manager, cross-functional managers, peers, so people you're gonna be working alongside. And this one I think is really interesting. The, the fourth interview, interviews with future subordinates. In other words, based on where you're coming into the organization, here's where we think you're gonna move up in terms of talent. Let's have you interview with some of the people that you might end up managing in two or three years. See if you fit with them. All of that gets into committee feedback and then uh, it's no longer the CEO, it's now just one or two of the senior leaders. It's often the CEO, but a couple different of the senior leaders look at that whole committee feedback and then they do the interview. And if you're noticing a trend, what do you think is the most important line in this? Is it the interview with the, the CEOs or the senior leaders, or is it the committee feedback? It's the committee feedback. Unless we think this is something that just, you know, hipster supermarkets and hipster tech companies do, uh, one of the most interesting organizations I found is a company called Steelscape. They make aluminum products, usually painted on aluminum siding, et cetera. And they've run, they run a, a physical factory, but they've turned the entire hiring process over to the men and women who are on that factory floor. So if you're wanting to get hired by Steelscape, there is a normal pre-employment screening, and that is, that's the normal phone screen, and that is the last thing that HR is involved in. After that, they're in the room, but they're sitting in the back making sure that nobody asks an illegal question. Because they've trained everybody who wants to get training on it in how to do a job interview. You come in for a pre-orientation that day and you meet the people that you're going to be working alongside and then you go off to a room and some of them actually interview in a panel interview process. Every single person in the company usually sits in on one or two of these a year. Why? Because if I'm going to be working right down the line from you, then I want to know what type of person you are. And that's the unifying theme, the unifying idea for all of this. Whether it is, as I said, a hipster grocery store, a hipster tech company, or whether it's an aluminum manufacturer, it's this. That the people who work with new hires should be the ones deciding whether or not they're hired. And that's, I think, the takeaway for all of us, no matter what size your business is, is to think about, okay, am I just putting all the weight of choosing talent on me? Or am I actually outsourcing some of that to the people that they're gonna be working alongside? Because whether or not that talent works out is honestly, yes, it's dependent upon us, but it's more dependent on the people that they're gonna be working alongside. You might not want to turn the whole hiring process over to them, but are they involved? Do they sit in on the interview and just give you feedback on what they think? Are they involved in even making recommendations? The, to the extent that we're trusting people to be working alongside teams, those are the teams that should be involved in making that decision to bring them in. And as you go through that, by the way, so to speak a little bit to the labor shortage idea, as you go through that, one of the things that we find is that whether it's a, a great market for talent or a tight market for talent, your hiring process says a lot about whether or not a person actually decides to join you. The reason, as I said earlier, that Google actually went from six, 12, sometimes 18 interviews down to four 
is that people hated going through that hiring process and they weren't able to get good talent. So as you're thinking through that whole hiring process, there's also the idea of however we decide, we also want to make sure it's a decent experience for all of the people that are um, potential employees because when they decide whether or not to join us, they're going to do it based on who do they get to meet. And getting to meet the people that you're going to be working alongside is a huge bonus for them as well. So we talked a bit about how do we bring people into the firm, how do we find them and bring them in. We should talk a little bit about what do we do once they're there to make sure that performance lives up to what we thought, to make sure the team is right, et cetera. And this is an area, this is a, a, a factor that I've studied for a, a while, and I almost always, when I bring this up in large organizations, get applause, and small business owners get like, oh, we don't have to do that? What am I talking about? I'm talking about the performance appraisal. How many, just by show of hands, how many of you have actually instituted a, a formal performance appraisal system in your company? So a couple, most of you are thinking like, okay, well, we're on the fence as to what we should do with it, whether we should do it, or whether or not we should revamp it. That's perfect. So what we're finding is more and more of those large organizations are actually throwing the performance evaluation process in the trash. They're just sort of abandoning it because it's not producing the outcomes they want. The goal of any performance appraisal or performance feedback system, those are, those are noble. You know, the goals are to provide feedback so that people can improve their performance and then to know who are the most talented people in the organization or who are the people that we're looking to for future leadership or as we expand for future management roles, et cetera. Those goals are perfectly noble. The problem is that a, a largely annual or sometimes semi-annual formal performance appraisal system usually doesn't meet those goals. And for those of you that said, okay, we do a formal one and we, um, we institute it, most of the time, a lot of organizations that, that do it copied it from some other organization, which I find really interesting from, a, from an entrepreneurship or small business owner capacity. Because presumably, you went to work for yourself for some reason that you, you, know, you hated working somewhere else, right? And then we go, oh, you know, we're big enough now, we need to be doing the system. Let's look around and look at best practices from bigger organizations. Isn't that the type of organization you just wanted to leave, <laughs> right? So, and performance appraisals are one of those things. But I find it comforting to know that they drive a lot of people nuts and now a lot of organizations are tossing them in the trash can. My favorite example of all of this is a company known as Adobe. I made a joke earlier about WordPress, but I promise almost everyone in this room has used Adobe at some point today, and if not, it's coming. Because they, they make Acrobat Reader and PDFs, they make uh, Photoshop, if you use that, they make a variety of different, uh, well, they're all up here, they make a variety of different computer technologies for audio and visual processing. Um, and they used to work, I don't know if you, if you remember this, they used to work on a system, software used to be this sort of annual system with new product ups, like, do you, remember, do you remember when you used to have to buy software in a box? Do you remember this? It was like a cereal box size, and then inside there was a floppy disk. Do you remember floppy disks? Do you remember floppy, right. Um, so you used, and you used to have to go to like Circuit City. <laughs> Does anybody remember Circuit? You used to have to go to Circuit City. Um, some, some of you probably put down like the tile at Circuit City. Um, you used to have to go to somewhere like that once a year. Usually it was in the fall. You'd get like the new Windows 95 update and it would presumably fix all of the bugs from the previous version. But of course, there'd be new bugs because then we wouldn't be able to sell next year's update, right? So we'll still have other bugs and we'll find those and we'll update it. So there used to be this annual cycle for all of software and you'd have to go and you'd go buy the cereal box size software thing and you'd install the update or you'd pay some IT company to do it all for you. And a number of years ago, Adobe moved from that to a subscription service. They took all of their software products and they put them in the cloud and they said, you know what? Pay us a certain amount of money every month and We'll just make sure that you have all of the updates you need. We can do updates much more often, so as we find a bug, we can fix it and have you install that update. And that, by the way, is why your computer is always dinging at you to install updates every single day. As frustrating as the cereal box software thing was, I think some of us would rather go back to that than just always having to do an update. But that's, we moved into that subscription service. Adobe was one of the pioneers in that. And when that happened, they started asking themselves, okay, well, we moved from an annual system in software to a subscription service, what are other things that we're doing on an annual basis that we should be thinking about doing much more often? And so they did a customer, uh, an employee-wide survey, and the number one thing that employees were frustrated with was the performance appraisal system. And so Donna Morris, the, the head of HR uh, internationally for Adobe, um, decided to scrap the whole thing. They took the tens of thousands of hours that managers were spending filling out that Word document with the drop-down menus and figuring out who comes to who and how we make it fit a inverted U so that we can have the top 10% in the middle and then fire the C's, except we have this whole complicated system. They threw all of that in the trash 
and they taught their managers how to coach. Specifically, they developed a, a coaching framework they called check-ins. And a check-in is really simple. A check-in is any conversation can be as little as 10 minutes. The only thing that gets documented, unless there's some legal reason why a certain thing needs to get documented, the only thing that gets documented is that it happened and how long it went. And it counts as a check-in as long as we cover three factors. Expectations, feedback, and growth and development. So a senior leader counts as a check-in if they sit down with one of their subordinates, they talk about expectations, feedback, growth and development. I see a couple people reaching for their phones, don't yet. I got more and then I'll tell you, the, the perfect slide's coming. So expectations, setting, tracking, and reviewing of clear objectives. What do we expect for you over the next week, month, three months, year, et cetera? This is what normally happens in a performance appraisal. Feedback, though, becomes a two-way street. It's the giving and receiving of ongoing feedback and coaching. This is not just here's how you're doing, but this is also how am I doing? Am I getting you the things that you need? You know, one of the, one of the number one things that we could point to in terms of uh, unleashing or that, that innovating the factory idea and unleashing employee talent is the idea that our job is to figure out what's preventing them from doing their best work and eliminate it. And that only happens if we do this giving and receiving of feedback. What's, what's blocking your potential? I mean, you'll have to know, it's always a judgment call on whether or not they're doing that or they're just complaining, but that's, that's part of our job is figure out, is this a valid thing? Is this actually blocking them or not? And then the last thing is a growth and development, the opportunity to talk about opportunities. This, by the way, you can grab your phones. This is the perfect slide to take a picture of. The opportunity to talk about opportunities, meaning where are you headed? Where do you want to go in your career? Is it inside of Adobe? Now you know why it's not documented, or is it not? And I think this is an issue that a lot of times small business owners face, is this idea that if we talk about growth and development, there aren't a lot of growth opportunities. We're this big, and yeah, we're gonna try and grow the organization as much as possible, but sometimes people are gonna have career aspirations that are bigger than what we can provide them in the time it would take them to grow into those roles. And unless you're doing what Adobe found, is unless you're not documenting the conversation, that never happens. If you've worked for a large organization and been subject to one of these performance appraisals, you know, as the employee, your job is to pretend that you want to be a manager. Am I right? Some of you are like, yeah, I went through exactly that. <clears throat> My last sort of real job before I became a professor and an author, I joked that I retired at 30 because I finished my PhD and I became a professor. That's as good as retirement. But my, my last job, I worked in the pharmaceutical industry for almost a decade, and I knew I was going to quit in two months. But, in, but three weeks later, I had to do my performance appraisal system, right? This is why I know everyone's job is to go, yeah, no, I, that's still my career goal is to get into management. Totally is. Totally not quitting in eight weeks, right? We know that. And unless we have this undocumented conversation, we can't really, we can't really have that. By the way, we're going to talk in a second about what to do with those employees. But unless we have an open and undocumented conversation, Adobe found that we couldn't actually talk about future opportunities. But how much more engaging is it if you're, if you're the manager or you're the owner and you know that this is where this person is headed and I can't provide them for that, but I can at least give them experiences that help them grow into that role? How much more engaged is that employee? And that's what, that's what Adobe found. So the idea behind check-ins is this is not something you do on an annual basis. It was encouraged every month or every two months, at least once a quarter. And the reason that this works is a couple different things. Right? The, the first is, well, actually, let me tell you what happened first before I tell you the reasons that it worked. I already hinted at them. Employees quitting just randomly dropped 30%, but this one I love. Involuntary departures increased by 50%. Involuntary departures is another euphemism for upgrading them to customer status or inviting them to be successful somewhere else. It, it means that in the old system, we used to have to wait 11 months to document your poor performance on, an, on a performance appraisal before we could fire you. Now, because we're doing check-ins every four to eight weeks, we can do it way faster, which is good, right? Um, productivity increases, revenue increases. Now, why? I told you there's two reasons. The first reason is perspective. The first reason is, is perspective, meaning how often do we check in and have a perspective on how that employee is performing and provide that a perspective to the employee. In an annual review system, it happened, you know, let's say, in June of every year, and then it happened in June of the next year. What I liken this to is, let's say you're a football team, and you go out and you play the first half, and then you go into the locker room, but we don't tell you the score. You're not allowed to know the score. How do you make any course corrections? 
right? How do you change things? I mean, you think about the halftime interview. Every time ESPN or CBS grabs the coaches, what are they asking them right at halftime? What are you going to change? What are you going to talk to them about in the next 20 minutes? The reason they can do that is that they got feedback for the first half on how they did. But if we're just relying on this sort of system and, oh, we'll talk about it then, we can't give them that feedback. They can't, you know, come back from like a 27-point deficit to win in the end because if you give Tom Brady 90 seconds, he's going to come back by 27 points or whatever it is every time. They, they fix those things at halftime. Now, by the way, by a show of nods, I now know who is from New England and who is not because clearly America's team is whoever plays the Patriots. <laughs> so we move from that to a system of one-on-one -on -one informal discussions. And when these informal discussions have, we have better perspective. Do you know what the other big motivating factor is, the reason that this all works? It's that growth and development piece. It's progress. The most potent human motivator that we've ever found out, it's not bonuses, it's not fancy titles, even though we make jokes about that. It's often not even just the general intrinsic sense of wanting to do this work. The most potent human motivator, do you know what it is? It's progress. The ability to feel that I'm making progress on a job, the ability to feel that I'm making progress on my overall career, the ability to feel that I'm part of an organization that's moving forward, all of those things are signifiers of progress. And the most beautiful thing to me about progress is that it's free. It doesn't take a fancy incentive compensation system. You don't have to answer all those questions about do we have an employee stock ownership plan or profit sharing or any of that sort of stuff. It's free to check in with an employee and go, where, where do you want to go in your career? And here's where we're headed. Where are we making progress on all these different things? It's free to celebrate the progress that they're making, provide them feedback on the progress that they're not. I mean, it takes time, but let's be honest, that time has an incredibly high return on investment because we know that this is the most potent motivator. The other thing, and this is just an aside, is often I talk in a lot of organizations, we talk about this one-on-one -on -one informal discussions, the progress, the check-ins, et cetera, and inevitably what comes up is the M word. When we talk about labor and the future of labor, everybody talks about the M word. Do you catch what the M word is? It's not four letters, it's, I don't even know how well. The M word is millennials, right? Or now Gen Z, because they're the ones that are starting to graduate out of college. How do we deal with this incoming generation, right? And if you're, if you're wondering what the generational splits are and all that sort of stuff, it doesn't really matter. My, my good friend Squint, Scott Stratton has a great way to tell who's millennial generation or who's not. When we use the word millennial, what we mean is people younger than us, we don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> but we talk about this generation as if massive things will have to change. One of them might have to change is this feedback thing. I mean, think about this generation. This is a generation that grew up playing video games where you could just die and you didn't have to put another quarter in the machine, you just get to start over. So if you want to test something and see, oh, will that work, you just make the jump and if you die, oh, well, you start again, it's free. It doesn't cost you 50 cents like it used to cost most of us with Space Invaders, right? If you, this is a generation that got report cards every quarter, that got annual standardized testing, that was in a feedback-rich environment. They went to colleges, universities, or trade schools where they had learning management systems where you could see your grade. Every time you took a new test would get updated, you just log into the website and see where you're standing. This is a generation that was soaked in feedback until they came of age and hit the world. And then we go, yeah, yeah, we'll check in with you in a year and see how you're doing. How's that working? You know, and I make jokes about it, but the truth is I think that's true for every other generation. The millennials and Gen Z are just arrogant enough to ask for it right off the bat. But most of us would have preferred that, right, rather than waiting. And these things happen, the ability to show that progress, the ability to show growth, they only happen if you're willing to switch to a system like this with check-ins. Now, I talked earlier about the growth and development piece and what happens when somebody grows out of an organization. And this leads me to what I think is one of the most interesting trends among organizations, and that's that starting with large organizations and moving smaller into mid-sized businesses and now small businesses, more and more organizations are actually celebrating employee departures, the good employee departures, not the upgraded to customer status, but the employees that actually grow out of the organization and head somewhere else. You know, and if you've worked in, in this business and in this industry for I don't know, longer than like a second. If you've been at this conference for, you know, at least yesterday, you came to realize that actually industries look a lot like networks. There's networks of vendors, suppliers, customers, et cetera. And most of the time when an employee leaves, they don't just hit sort of the exit, they're stepping somewhere else. 
most organizations are, have that sort of career ladder focus, right? We still use that climbing the corporate ladder thing, even though I, I think it's a terrible metaphor because it looks like a pyramid, not a ladder, because there's not a guaranteed path for everybody. Eventually, they grow out of the organization. It's just going to happen. The smaller your organization, the more likely it is to happen if you're not growing at the rate that these people are growing their professional careers. But the truth is, when they step out, they don't just leave. They don't just hit the exits. They don't just depart, right? A, a lot of times, they step somewhere else in the network. But what, what, what's our sort of natural human temptation is to treat a departure almost like a betrayal. What? You're not happy anymore? Get out of here, right? If you ever worked for a large organization and you resigned, you got what I like to call the security guard in the box. Anybody ever get the security guard in the box? Yeah? Yeah? Oh, I... There's people patting each other on the back. I remember when you got the security guard in the box. That was offensive, right? But we do it. I got, so I was telling you about the organization before. When I finally did leave, I got the virtual version of the security guard in the box. So I sent an email to that same manager that I pretended that I was going to want to be a manager with. I sent an email to her and I said, you know, consider this my two weeks notice. I'm leaving for this reason, et cetera. And... <clears throat> About 45 minutes later, she calls me, and she has this whole process that we've got to go to check out. I, apparently, I gave my two weeks notice, but that's my last day. I found that out on the call, right? And then she's, she's going through this whole thing, and I could tell that she was reading. Do you know, have you ever been on a phone call, and you could just tell that they're reading? If, if you don't, you, you probably need a couple more lawyers on speed dial, because they're, they're the ones that normally drive a lot of this. I can tell she's just reading, and so finally I just said, you know, okay, I can tell you're reading. Why don't you just email me that whole document, I'll, I'll go through it, and I'll just email you back when I'm done, because it'd be easier than sitting on the phone listening to you read. And she says, oh, I can't do that. Okay, why not? We shut off your email 37 minutes ago. <laughs> I gave two weeks notice, and seven minutes later, my email system is shut off. I'm like, I can't even log into my own computer. I got the virtual version of the security guard in the box. So long, have a great life, right? But the reality is most of the time when an employee departs, when a partner departs, et cetera, they're stepping somewhere else in that network. That network that we manage of client companies and, and uh, vendors, competitors, partners, it's actually what I love about organizations like this is that you understand the power of this broader network. In, in big MSAs, you get that, like, some of the times you even have competitors that are also members, and you, yeah, okay, you're kind of both bidding for the business, but you also want to help each other. That, first of all, that's rare. So when you find a group like this to be a part of, stay. That's my 30-second advertisement for the network. Um, but it, it's very, very rare that people have that accurate approach to our industry is a network, and I need to be aware of where everybody goes, because when employees leave, a lot of times they leave to go somewhere else in that network. Now they're on the client side, or now they're on the installer side. Now they're where, wherever they are, they're somewhere else in the network. And what we know from a lot of research in the world of network science is that paying attention to that network is hugely important. One of my favorite studies is a study done uh, by a brilliant researcher named Brian Uzi. And what Brian wanted to track was the survivability of firms in industries as a sort of dependent variable on how the owners of the senior leaders of that industry approach networks. So most of us, we think about a network like this, most of us are, are managing two types of connections, two types of ties in that network. There's the arm's length connections and the close-knit connections, the close-knit ties. Think about this in the, in the context of Fuse. The close-knit ties are the people that you showed up early and went golfing on Sunday with or that you saw you know, yesterday afternoon and immediately gave a hug to. Those are the close-knit ties. The arm's line connections are the people that like, oh yeah, I remember your name. We ate at the same table two years ago, right? But you know both of them, they both count as connections. And what's interesting is that former employees become these connections as well, but you get to choose whether or not they're close-knit ties or arm's line connections. And everybody runs their business differently. Some people run the very close-knit, I just do business with a small group of people that I know, like, and trust, and I will, I will lose money on a bid to keep that close client. Other people are like, keep everybody at an arm's length. It, it doesn't matter where um, the bid comes from. I'm going to do, do whatever it takes. I'm, I'm just running the numbers on it. I don't really necessarily care about the relationships. Most people, though, fall somewhere in the middle. 
And it turns out that it's the people that are kind of smack dab in the middle, that know that they need to keep relationships with arms length ties and keep checking in with a lot of people, but they also know that they need what's known as in network science as bonding capital. They need a few a small group of people that they trust that are fellow business owners, that are former employees, that are clients, that they can actually have open, honest conversations about where they're struggling with, right? about issues beyond just moisture. They need to have conversations about how, what do you do for this, how do you do for that? You need those close-knit ties as well. And so it's the organizations that manage that tension, that stay right in the middle between cultivating a close group of people and then having lots of contacts that we at least stay in touch with that have the highest rates of survivability. You know, I caught in the panel, the very last question was about where's the future of the industry headed, what are your guesses, et cetera. And all of those guesses are great, but I would argue that survivability matters the most, right? Because if we're not in business, it doesn't matter where the future of the industry is headed. So survivability becomes that, and it only comes from managing those connections. And if you think about it, having a system where you're keeping in touch with those former employees who are somewhere else in the network is a brilliant way to manage those close-knit ties and arm's line connections, because they're somewhere else in the network, and if you maintain that relationship, they can be feeding you that information about changes, about updates, about things that you wouldn't get if you're just too clustered in here, and you're not getting information from the fringes of the industry. And they can also, um, you can also have those conversations with them because they used to be that close. So what we're seeing is a lot of organizations that are making that flip and developing what they call alumni networks. They're treating former employees as if they were alumni graduating from university or a trade school, et cetera. We're gonna celebrate that they used to work here, then they graduated out. The, the first example I'll give you is a, is a tech example from the company that should know more about how to do this than anyone else because everybody else's alumni networks run on their platform. The first is LinkedIn. LinkedIn as a company got to a point about 10 years ago where they realized they had more former employees than current employees. Anybody there? You have more former employees than current employees? And they realized we should probably do something about that, right? Because most of our former employees have a LinkedIn account. We can reach out to them whenever we want because we own the software they have the account on. But what they did was they set up kind of a two-tiered network. Any former employee who left on good terms was invited into the first tier. This was an all-inclusive tier. And they would send out periodic surveys. They would invite them to big events to talk about what's going on with new product updates and what have you. And then depending on what your role in the organization was or how you interact in that lower tier, they might upgrade you up into an invitation-only network. And that's where we bring you on and have focus groups. We tell you where the company is headed. We give you information like you were an employee because we want to see your reaction to it. And we want you to give us information about what's going on elsewhere in the industry and in the network. And managing this two-tier, it's a great way to balance that close-knit and arm's length connection piece. Other organizations, the consulting firm Accenture has a great alumni program. The thing that I like the best, so any alumni gets a login to a member portal. The thing that I like best is, is twofold. One, that portal also represents a talent pool. Now this is a large organization, so some of you are looking like, we can't do this, and that's okay. But they actually help former employees find new jobs. We know you worked here, upload your profile on here. We get a lot of people that ask us for talent, so we're happy to talk about it. And then the thing that I think is most interesting, and everybody could do this, is they run an employee referral bonus for former employees. In most businesses, you get to a certain size and you figure, okay, I've got these employees that I, I love. If they refer somebody else who comes to work, rather, rather than you know, pay for listings on monster.com and CareerBuilder and other places, I might just, you know, hey, thanks for finding us that awesome employee. Here's a thousand bucks, here's 2,000 bucks, what have you. This employee referral bonus thing. Accenture went a step further and said, if you used to work for us, you're probably the best person to refer us talent, right? I mean, think about it. You no longer work for us. You work somewhere else, and you probably know two or three people you work alongside now that are dissatisfied with where they are now. So we'll actually incentivize you giving us those names, and if they work out, we'll give you uh, a little bonus for it. It's something that most companies do just for their internal employees, but Accenture realized that the best brand ambassadors for a company to work are former employees, not current ones. Because the former employees know a lot more people that might be dissatisfied with which your company might be the answer. Lastly, another one I think is interesting is Chevron. Chevron runs the same network, same portal, but they have this program called the Bridges Program where after you've worked there for, after you haven't worked there for a year, if they need talent, they'll actually bring it out, back out on a contractor basis. So yeah, still work at that firm, but we'll pay you for 10 hours a week of consulting because you have some knowledge that disappeared and went away. And this is probably the other thing that we get a lot of times when we talk about these employee alumni networks, this idea of betrayal and what have you is that there's, there's real value to celebrating departures and making sure that farewells become see you later because when that happens, information flows multiple ways. 
Most of us, what we're worried about is, oh, we've got this system, we've got these client relationships, we've got this proprietary way we do something, and the people that depart, they take that information with us, and it's wrong. We poured a bunch of knowledge into them, and then they just took it, and now they're working somewhere else. But what we know from copious different studies is that if we keep those relationships, the information flows both ways, that we start to learn new things about the industry too, that we start to learn other ways about it, that we start to get referrals for jobs that that company that they went to work with can't do, but we can. All of these things happen if you treat it like a back and forth exchange. And I know you would be thinking like, I don't wanna create this broad, I don't even like the guy I pay to do my website, I'm not gonna have him do an online portal for all of my former employees. But what if you just call him from time to time? Say, hey, we wanna check in, it's been, you know, I, I know you're happy over there, but I just wanted to say we loved having you before and I hope you're doing well. Sometimes those little check-ins create longer conversations. One firm that I, I talked to about this sent me an email about six months after I gave a, a talk at their organization and said, we started having an annual picnic for former employees too. And in the spring, we've got our spring event for current employees, and in the fall now, we invite former employees. We just check in once a year with them. That's more on the arm's length side, but the close knit, but you still keep that relationship at play, and you still get um, a lot of positive benefits of having that relationship, because you're managing that tension between the close knit ties, which would be your current employees, and the arm's length connection, which are now, in addition to the members of this network, are the former employees as well by keeping in touch with them. Now, I know what you might be thinking by now. Um, we talked about a lot of different ideas. We talked about that key idea of great leaders don't innovate the product, they innovate the factory. <clears throat> and then from there, we talked about sort of that whole life cycle of talent. How do you, how do you make sure that when you do make the decision to hire someone, it, it, I mean, it's, it's frustrating sometimes just to find talent to bring in, but then to bring in the wrong one costs even more. So how do you find the right people? How do you manage and give them performance feedback on a regular basis so that they can grow and you can grow too? And what do you do when they depart? We've talked about a lot of different ideas, and one or two of them probably sounded crazy. I've done this long enough to know. Okay, not everybody responds to every single idea. A, that's fine, because that might not be a, a, that might not be a solution to a problem that you have, but B, a lot of times, there's a little bit of a resistance to this change because there's a love of what we're doing now, right? Oh, that sounds crazy because we do something that's nothing like that. We do this thing over here. So which I've just got a simple question. It's the Dr. Phil question, actually. How's that working for you? And when I, when I think about this and I have these conversations, my mind always goes, I told you I was a nerd. My mind always goes to my college physics class. I don't remember a lot from that class. I really don't. What I do remember is one little stat that I heard that I thought was incredible. They told me one random day in lecture, we were talking about thermodynamics, I think, and they told me that the internal combustion engine, the internal combustion engine that we all, that powers, well, I, I used to say that powers all of our cars, that powers most of our cars, the internal combustion engine is actually only 30% efficient. 30% efficient. Now that's not fuel efficiency, that's a thing that the car industry made up to sound more efficient than they are. What they mean is that if you take a gallon of gasoline, there is a certain amount of energy that's stored in that gallon of gasoline and the internal combustion engine transforms 30% of that energy into forward motion. The rest is lost to heat and friction and stuff that I don't actually understand. The rest is just lost, it's gone, it's only 30% efficient. And it's sort of the how's that working for you question, right? 30% efficient, it's, it sounds terrible when you phrase it that way, that we're losing 70% of that power. Now if we think about it, we think about this idea that great leaders don't innovate the product, they innovate the factory, that we've moved from a physical factory to an idea factory, well, unlike Frederick Taylor's day, the fuel running most of our organizations is not brute labor. Labor is still involved, but let's be honest, there's some mental energy there too. The products are confusing, keeping them all straight is, is hard enough, there's a lot of tacit knowledge that we have to have, and then we have to call up to solve a customer problem. That's mental energy. Even when there is labor involved, right, it's still sort of far more complex than 16 and a half pounds of shovel going, of coal going into a furnace. Most of us are, even if we're using brute labor, are still having to think when we move through and use that labor. So the fuel running most of our organizations is not brute labor anymore, it's mental energy. So the question becomes, okay, great. Well, how are we doing as an organization capturing that? If an internal combustion engine is only 30% efficient, how are we as organizations capturing the mental energy of the people that work for us and with us and turning that into productivity, into profitability, et cetera? Well, we're not doing that well. 
Worldwide, the stats on a, a phenomenon known as employee engagement, what percentage of employees say that they are bringing their whole selves, their whole energy, their whole knowledge to work? What percentage of employees are saying, I, my skill set is perfectly matched with the demands of the, the task, I'm not bored because I'm overqualified and I'm not frustrated because I'm underqualified? What percentage of employees are fully engaged in the organization? Worldwide, it's about 18%. Now, in, in North America, we're doing a little bit better, it's 30%. It's 30%, which is right where we were with the internal combustion engine. And so every day we celebrate technologies, inventors, innovators that are trying to squeeze more out of the internal combustion engine. We celebrate the tinkerers that are trying to do more with that. That's why not all of us drive an internal combustion engine. Some of us have a, a Tesla or a Prius or a Chevy Volt or a number of cars that didn't sell all that well, but we still don't fault people for trying it. Well, I think organizations run the same way. So yeah, there's probably been a couple ideas that you think and go, I don't know if that would ever work, but what would happen if you try it? What would happen if you play around with it? Maybe you'll see, you know what, we took the Whole Foods idea, but we did it this way, and now it's working. It's that willingness to be a tinkerer, to think of our organization as that factory that needs innovation so that people can innovate the products and the services that we deliver. It's thinking of it as a tinkerer, being willing to play around with that internal combustion engine so maybe we can get a little more energy out of it. As we know, you know, your job, because it's any leader's job, is not just to innovate the product, it's to innovate the factory to draw that up. Now, I wanna say at the outright, I'm not like a, a naive optimist, right? I don't think that just by hiring as a team and changing your performance appraisal system and celebrating departures, you're gonna go from 18 or 30% to 100%. But goodness, if we can get that to 50, Right? If, we could, if we could double it and get it to 60, how much more growth would that be for our company? How much more profitability and productivity? How many more satisfied customers from a job done properly that we don't have to go back and, and redo? How much more of that happens through that tinkering? I have, I have two boys, they're seven and five. And so when I think about this internal combustion engine and I think about this 30% metric, right? To tell me that in 13 years, if this doesn't get any better, my kids are gonna hit the workforce and they have a 20% chance of finding a job that fully uses their knowledge, skills, and abilities that they love doing, that sounds horrible, right? It's depressing if you think about that, as if you have a child, as they go, oh, we got, if we can get it to, I mean, if we could flip a coin, right, get it to 50%, we could flip a coin, or like one of them is happy and one of them is not, that's still better than where we are now, right? But if it's unacceptable for parents in the room, if it's unacceptable to think about that for our own children, well, our employees are the same way. Why is it acceptable there? Why aren't we continuing to try things, continuing to try and innovate that factory? I promise you this, and this is the last thought. Okay, great leaders don't innovate the product, they innovate the factory. I promise you this, that if you try one of these ideas and it doesn't work, your people are still gonna appreciate that you tried. And hopefully they'll give you feedback on what didn't work about it, and you can grow and tinker it into your own thing. So we've given you a lot of different ideas about the whole life cycle of talent. I know there's a lot of questions, and so one of the things that I committed to do is I'll be around during break and during lunch so we can ask those sort of specific questions and tee that in. But in the meantime, this is that takeaway as we head into that lunch, is to ask, if great leaders don't innovate the product, they innovate the factory. If my organization is an idea factory, what am I doing day to day to keep tinkering and producing those innovations? And if the answer is nothing, that's the wrong answer. And if the answer is something, anything, hopefully it resonates with an idea today, but if the answer is anything, then at least my people are gonna appreciate that we're trying, that we're trying to make it better, and they're gonna respond in kind, and then together, as one organization, we'll get those innovations that we need to survive. Great leaders don't innovate the product, they innovate the factory. What are you going to do moving forward to innovate your own individual factories? Thank you all so much for having me.